Very exciting. Today, we will be discussing lesson two of our documentary lesson series. Uh, I got like four of them, I think, four lessons of them. And we're going to do lesson two today, which is a big one. This is a big one. I'm about to hit you with a lot of information. Um, but it's critical stuff that you're just going to have to know. So the cool thing about documentary interviews that I kind of talked about the other day was that um, there's a kind of a set of rules that you follow. And if you follow the set of rules, it's really easy to make professional looking work and you can make your work look really, really good. Um, so today we're going to be focusing on those rules. Um, and if you can get these rules down, if you can practice these rules and you can memorize these rules and just kind of really get comfortable with them, you're going to be a pro and your work will look professional. And this is the kind of skills, these skills, guys, this is the stuff that we're talking about today. This is the kind of stuff that not only does this translate into all of your work, not just documentary, but all of your future film work. So all of your future film work is going to look a lot more professional all of a sudden. But this is also the kind of stuff that gets you hired. This is the kind of stuff that people look at your work and say, oh, I want this person because their work looks professional. This is also the stuff that people regularly need. This is the stuff that people want you to do for them. This is the stuff that gets you paid. And I'm not talking about getting paid, you know, in years from now when you graduate college. I'm talking about like today. I'm talking about like right now. You learn this now, you can get paid now to do these types of jobs. I have students who get, get these types of jobs all the time and they get paid to do these things all the time. Flo constantly sends out emails from the community of people who want this type of work done and they'll pay you like 500 bucks to do it. Um, and it's not hard if you learn the rules. So today we're gonna focus on all of these rules. Hang on just a second, I'm gonna turn off my heater. It's getting kind of warm. Thank you. So today, without further ado, now that I am comfortable in the room temperature that is the new classroom, we are going to focus on documentary film, the technical rules of the interview. So everything that we are talking about today is about the technical rules of the interview, okay? So, before we begin, let me ask you the question, what makes a quality documentary interview? What do you think? You're gonna have to speak up, I'm afraid. What makes a quality documentary interview? You interview people relevant to the subject and give their credentials. Okay, good, good. I personally appreciate it when I don't hear the person asking too many questions, but I can infer what the questions are based on what they say. Good, okay. Okay, those are both good responses. Both of those focused on the content, which is the most important part for sure. But since today's lesson is all about the technical skills, let's focus on the technical skills. What makes a good quality documentary interview from a technical perspective? So uh, regardless, regardless of the person being interviewed and the documentary. Good audio. Okay, good clean audio is a huge important factor. In fact, it's so important, we're gonna spend Thursday just talking about audio. We're not even gonna talk about audio at all today because it's its own little animal, it's its own thing. So we're gonna focus on audio on Thursday. So you're absolutely correct. For sure, audio is absolutely mission critical. In fact, I would say audio is more important than all the video stuff. What else makes a good quality documentary interview? Good framing and good lighting. Good. We're going to talk about both of those things today. Anything else? Is that all there is to it? The person, the person being interviewed isn't looking into the camera. Good. We will talk about that as well. Any others? That's a pretty good list to start. That's a pretty good list to start. So today we're gonna to talk about all of these technical rules and all these aspects. So this is kind of a brief overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna to squeeze it all in into this short period of time that I have. 
Um, so we're going to talk about camera placement and the distance. So where do you place your camera? Like, how do I know where to put my camera, where to place the camera, how to aim the camera? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the shot types. We're going to talk about like how and where and to frame all that type of shot, right? Because the shot type and the framing of the subject, how they fit into that shot type, how you frame that subject in that shot type is going to be really, really important to getting that professional look. We want that professional look, right? Uh, we're going to talk about the shot composition. That means what's in the frame. Okay, so we have the shot type. That's like close up, medium shot, wide shot. Remember that stuff. Then the framing of the subject, how you frame the person. And then we have shot composition. What else is in the frame? So we're going to talk about all those things. We're going to talk about your lens choice because your lens choice matters. Which lens am I going to use for this interview? You got some choices. Why do you want to use one versus a different one? Okay, we're going to talk about lighting. We're going to talk about eye lines because that's really, really important as you're going to discover. And we're going to talk about the dual camera setup. Okay, so these are all things that we are going to talk about today. But the first thing you need to know about doing a documentary is that what can go wrong will go wrong. This is standard operating procedure for a documentary. What can go wrong will go wrong. And what I mean by that is you know, it, this is not a narrative film, right? A narrative film, we did storyboarding. We planned everything. We got every single shot put together and we figured out what we were going to do and we made it perfect, right? We did multiple takes until we got it right. If the actor flubbed a line or if I messed up the camera shot, we just did it over again, right? So the narrative film, you're going to craft everything perfectly until we get it right. We're going to prepare, we're going to plan, and then we're going to do it again and again and again, and then we're going to edit it in post. Okay. With a documentary, you don't have that option because a documentary, you, you don't know what's going to happen a lot of the time. You don't know what's going to be said. If you're filming an event, you don't know what's going to happen. You're going to show up and you're going to start filming. You can plan what kind of shots you think you might want to get, but stuff's going to happen. You're going to have to roll with it. You can't plan out too much of a documentary because it's all happening in real time and there's not going to be more than one take this is the scary part if you don't get it you don't get it you got one shot at it there's no take two or take three right with the documentary it's like you got one shot at it and if you don't get it you don't get it period so it's a little intimidating in that way so what can go wrong in that sense oftentimes will go wrong. And as a documentary filmmaker, you have to be ready to roll with it. You have to be, re be ready to take the punches. You have to be ready at a moment's notice to go and shoot. You have to be ready to hit record when, when all of a sudden stuff starts happening. And you got to run and gun. We call that running and gunning. And you just got to get it when in that moment when it happens. So as a documentary filmmaker, you really got to be on your toes. And you really got to be ready at any moment to hit that record button and just shoot what you got to shoot in order to get the shot, even if it's not always going to look pretty. So the example that I like to give for this is when I was a very, very young filmmaker, I was just getting started. I think, I, I think I'd taken like one film class in college uh, and I got one of my very first jobs and I was hired by a gym to do a little documentary on one of their patrons. It was an amazing story. They had this um, guy uh, who used to come into their gym with his mom. And the story was that this guy had been living down in Los Angeles. He was like 25 years old or something like that. Uh, and he was an aspiring actor. He was trying to get little roles here and there. He had like a background role in 300 and, and you know, different little parts like that where he was mostly working as an extra, but he was trying to like break into Hollywood and he was a good looking guy and, and he was taking acting classes and he was just trying to make it as an actor. And then one day, very tragically, he had a brain aneurysm um, in his apartment and they found him um, like hours later um, and he had had this brain aneurysm and, and it changed him ever afterwards. His mind was never the same after that and he couldn't walk after that. He didn't, he, could, he didn't have use of his limbs after that. He was confined to a chair where he really could not move and function um, the way that, that he could in the past. So he moved back home uh, and his mother basically took care of him. And the cool part about this story is every day his mom would wheel him over to the gym and they would go to the gym and she'd get him out of the chair 
and she would put him on these machines and she would painstakingly move his limbs with the machines and he'd practice moving his arms and he would practice moving his legs and they did this every day and they became this pair at the gym that was super recognizable that everybody knew uh, because they just kept coming in day after day after day after day and an amazing thing happened he actually began to develop control of his limbs again um, years after years of this, not only could he start doing these things on his own with his arms and everything, he, de he developed the ability to walk again. Uh, it was amazing. It was absolutely phenomenal. It was just a huge inspiration to everyone at this gym. Everyone knew these people. Um, and it was this amazing story. So the gym, um, you know, I, I knew somebody there and they hired me. They said, hey, we want you to make this documentary because this is an amazing story. And I said, wow, what a cool opportunity. So I made this documentary and what can go wrong will go wrong. And this was one of the first jobs I ever got hired to do. And I learned a lot. And I also learned about, you know, what not to do and, and how to avoid some mistakes in the future. So one of the first things that I learned is you got to make sure you know your equipment. And so uh, they hired me to do this job. And I, when I was talking to the people, I said, okay, I can bring in a camera and all that kind of stuff. And they said, oh, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. We have a camera. One of our board members has this really nice camera and we're going to have you use that. And I said, are you sure? Because I can bring in a camera. And they're like, no, 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 no. This is a nice camera. We want you to use this. And I said, OK. And I went in and they gave me this camera and it was this little consumer camcorder camera. Um, and it didn't it didn't record onto SD card because this was a long time ago. And But it also didn't record onto tape, which is what most cameras recorded on back then. That, oh, no. Oh, no. This camera recorded onto mini DVD. Now, this was a very short-lived period of time in the history of consumer electronics. Um, this was not a good format to record on. In fact, there's a reason why none of you have a camera that records onto mini DVD. This was a period of time that only lasted for like a year or two because it was so awful. Um, so I had this camera that was recording onto a little disc, a little mini DVD disc. And then there was no great microphone on it. And to top it all off, um, not only was I not so familiar with the camera, but I could not understand or figure out, or even if it had the ability to properly expose the camera. Uh, and this gym was wall to wall, ceiling to floor, all the way around windows. It was a beautiful gym with all this natural light coming in, but it was just windows all the way around. Sunny, 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 super, super bright. So all of my shots were really, really overexposed. And then I started interviewing this mother and she was so sweet and so kind and also the single most soft-spoken person I've ever met in my entire life. I mean, everything she said was a whisper, literally a whisper. I've never heard anyone speak so quietly in my life. Meanwhile, you've got all the gym treadmills in the background and all this kind of stuff. And I'm trying to capture this sound of this really great story from this very soft-spoken woman. Um, so I was frustrated because I felt like I was dropping the ball. I had been hired by this group to do this documentary. I felt like it wasn't coming out good at all. I think I even made it black and white in the end because the exposure was so overexposed that like that was the only way I could kind of hide how atrocious it looks and all this kind of stuff. I was not satisfied with this documentary at all. But as I mentioned the other day, documentary is perhaps one of the most forgiving formats of the, of the film genres. And when I completed this documentary, even though it was full of all of these problems and all of these technical issues that I was really dissatisfied and embarrassed about, the gym loved it. The gym loved it. The families loved it. Their, their patrons loved it. Everyone loved this documentary and they were super, super happy with it because it was a good story. I didn't do anything to make the story good. It was just a good story. It was a heartwarming, nice story. Uh, and the content was good. The, the interview content was good. Even though everything else about it was horrible, it still ended up being an okay documentary for someone my age who was making it at the time. And it was my very first attempt with very limited equipment and so on and so forth. I was embarrassed by it and I knew I could do better, but it was still a good story because I wasn't, it wasn't a narrative film. I didn't have to get anyone to believe in a fictional world that I was creating. There was no suspension of disbelief. Everybody knew this was a documentary. And so it's technically, it was technically a lot more forgiving. So that's gonna happen to some of you, right? You're gonna have some issues with your documentaries and a lot of things are gonna go wrong technically. 
Um, and this project is going to stretch you and help you grow technically more than any of any of the other projects that we do this year. But the good news is, is that for the format, even if you make some mistakes, even if you screw up, it doesn't matter so much. It's not going to hurt the story the way it would hurt the story if it was a narrative film. Okay. So be prepared for that. What can go wrong will go wrong and just get ready to really go, go, go at a moment's notice and capture whatever it is you need to capture in that, in that moment. All right, so let's start with camera placement. Where do we place the camera? If we were in class today, I would, um, I would have someone volunteer and come up to the front of the class and I would, I would demonstrate by having a live subject, but we can't really do that. So we're gonna do the best we can uh, through slides and through the digital world of online media. So the first thing we wanna think about is where to place that camera. So we sit down in my interview. So let's say I'm interviewing Sarah. I pick Sarah because she happens to be front and center in my screen right now. So I'm gonna interview Sarah. So where am I going to place that camera? So I'm gonna have her sit down where she's comfortable and I'm gonna sit down my camera and I'm gonna start setting it up. And I want to set it at eye level. Now, this is a, this is a secret. This is a life hack. Okay, this is this is something that this is this is a code word for everything. This is a, this is just one thing that you can remember because it's going to be the answer to everything today. And it's at eyes. It's all about the eyes. Everything is about the eyes today, because the eyes are the windows to the soul. All right, eyes are the most important part of our interview. Okay, so I'm going to place the camera at eye level. That's where I want it to be, so it will look the best. So if I'm looking at my image right now. My camera is actually a little bit above eye level uh, because it has to be because I'm talking over a, a monitor right now. If it was any lower, you'd see the monitor and I don't want that, but I am angling it down a little bit. So I'm kind of at eye level, like this, this would be kind of eye level, sort of like I got to like tilt myself back a little bit, but basically, basically I'm close to eye level and this is what we want. Okay, so you want that camera to be at eye level so that we can see the eyes, because again, the eyes are the most important thing of all, okay? So think eye level. Everything that we do today is gonna be at eye level. So we're gonna place the camera at eye level. We are going to put the camera just off of center, okay? We don't want the camera right facing center. So for example, here's what we don't want. We don't want the camera directly facing my face exactly like so, okay? We don't want that because then I look right into the lens and I'm looking right into the camera and staring at the audience. And if you're an audience member, this can be kind of intimidating a little bit. This can be kind of like too much, you know, like I feel like, I, you know, they're staring into my soul, right? I'm drilling a hole in all of your faces right now. Um, but I'm not actually looking at your faces. I'm looking at the camera. All right, so we don't want, we don't want this. We wanna be just off of center. So we're gonna turn that camera just a little bit, depending on which way I'm having my person face. Okay, so we want that camera just off of center. And then you should have something that looks kind of like this. So this is from a documentary shoot that I did. This is from a corporate video that I did or that I worked on. I shouldn't say I did it. I did it with other people um, that I worked on um, many, many years ago. This was for McAfee. Um, which is a company that does like antivirus software and stuff in Santa Clara. By the way, this is where the money is, guys. This is where the money is. Corporate videos, <sighs> lots of budget, lots of money to be made in the world of corporate videos. You want to make some money, learn these interviewing skills, these technical skills that I'm talking about today, uh, and then go find yourself a nice corporate sponsorship and they'll pay you tens of thousands of dollars to make videos for their staff that only like 10 people ever actually watch. And it's, that, that's the truth. That's the truth. So here, here's a still from a shot that I did when I was doing this interview set with McAfee. And you can see um, that the camera is at eye level, right? And it's just off of center. So I'm looking uh, off of center. I'm not looking directly down his face. I'm looking just off of center. So if this was a clock, for example, so think about the hands of a clock, right? So if he's sitting at 12 o'clock, okay, and the person he's talking to is sitting at six o'clock, my camera, this camera, looks like it's at around maybe 7.30, eight o'clock, somewhere around there. Do you guys get what I'm saying? Okay, 
So just off of center. It's not at six o'clock where he'd be looking right at it. It's at like seven or eight o'clock, just off of center. All right, that's what we're going for. All right, so now the shot type. Now that we got the camera placement down, let's think about the shot type. So think back to your video scavenger hunts way back when. All this stuff matters again. All right, so be thinking about your shot type. What kind of a shot do you want to use for your interviews? Do you want a wide shot, a medium shot, a close up? What kind of shot is it going to be? Okay, so these, all those shots that we got during the video scavenger hunt, all those shots that we use during our narrative project, that still matters. Those still apply. Okay, but you want to get a little bit of variety too. You don't want to be all the same in your shots. So, for example, um, if I'm interviewing Sarah um, and I'm viewing, interviewing Autumn, all right, for the same documentary, I might want to mix it up a little bit. Maybe I don't want to interview all my shots, you know, like I don't want to do all close ups, right? I want to do some medium shots too. I want to do some wide shots as well. That gives me some freedom and some variety to kind of put things together. Okay. All right. We want to stay too apart in our shot types. Okay, we want to stay too apart in our shot types. So what I mean by that is, so if you like, so here's some shot types, for example, right? We've got an extreme close up here. We've got a close up. We've got a medium close up. We've got a medium shot. We've got a wider shot. We've got a full body wide shot. Okay, these are all kind of the places where you would frame shots, right? You're gonna cut off in these right places. You know, you cut off just above the waist or in the mid chest or you know just below the head or you cut off at the forehead for that extreme close up right you want to make sure you know where those shots are okay where does the medium shot actually go where does the close up actually go so when you're getting your shot types we want variety we want to get a few of these but we want to stay too apart so what i mean by that is we want to stay too apart so that we have so we have opportunity to edit between these shots okay so if for example I am filming one of these at a close up. Here's a close up. Okay. I want my other camera filming to be at least two away. So, like a medium shot. So, like a close up and a medium shot. Those will cut together very, very nicely. Or a medium close up and a medium full shot. Those will cut together very nicely. If I use a close up and a medium close up, you see how these are kind of too similar? If I cut between these, they look kind of the same. Not only does it not have variety, but now it's going to feel like a jump cut. Remember our thing, whole thing about jump cuts from narrative? Like we don't like jump cuts. Jump cuts don't look good, right? And so we want to try to break that up. And that way I can edit between a close up and a medium shot. I can edit between those two shots and cut, get rid of a lot of material that I don't want and save just the material that I do want. Um, and that'll make for a nice seamless edit while still adding variety without making it feel like I'm jump cutting around. Make sense? It'll make it feel more fluid and more natural while also providing some variety for the audience. So it's a win-win all the way around. So stay too apart in your shot types, close up, medium shot, so on and so forth, like break it up into these two parts. All right, which brings us to the framing of our subject. The framing is also really, really important. Okay, so now that we've decided uh, I'm, I'm going I'm to shoot uh, Sarah and I'm going to shoot her if I was shooting with the camera that she's using right now, uh, you know, this looks like a nice, you know, medium close up that looks good to me. Um, that sounds good. I'm going to do a medium close up. If I was going to shoot Dana, however, Dana is actually not in medium close up land right now. She's cut off at a medium close up, but she's further away from that. So I would actually lower her camera. Her camera's aimed too high right now. I would lower her camera and I would film her at more of a medium shot. Right? I want to make sure I know where these framings actually apply. And once we get our shot type figured out, now we need to figure out how to frame of our shots. And this all comes down to the rule of thirds. So we all like the rule of thirds. Here's Jim. We all like Jim too. Hey, Jim. So Jim's going to help us out today with the rule of thirds. So the rule of thirds is the idea that you break up your square into thirds, creating like nine squares in our frame. Okay. And that we and that we the eye naturally likes to look at things on the thirds. Okay, so the thirds are these intersections here. Here's a third. Here is a third. Here is a third. And here is a third. Okay, those are the points of intersection. Okay, if we place objects or things or subjects on those intersections, it will just look better. Don't ask me why. It just will. It will look 
better. It will look more artistic. It will look better. Um, and I think that's because the eye feels like it needs to look somewhere. And if you put it right in the middle, that feels a little strange. We don't like things that are just right in the middle. Um, but artistically, it's nice to weight things on a certain little side here or there. Um, and that's going to look good. We'll replace it. So I do this all the time um, when I'm doing our Zoom class. I always talk on the rule of thirds. I'm always here on this rule of third. You may have noticed. See? Good. Or I could be over here on this rule of third. Okay. Now I'm, I'm not going to be down here in this rule of third. Okay. That looks dumb. It makes it look like I'm sinking. I don't like that. Um, I'm going to put myself on the upper rule of thirds. That's where we want to be. Okay. The upper, the, the two upper rules of thirds are where you should place your subject, just like we see um, over here on Jim. Okay. So put, put your subjects on the upper rules of thirds. This is where the action is. Okay. So that's the first part of framing our subject. Okay. So if, for example, I'm looking at your shots right now, if I'm looking at all of you, uh, turn on your cameras if you don't have them turned on, because we're going to actually use your cameras today. So turn them on if you haven't already turned them on. Um, so if we're looking at your camera shots today, um, for example, I'm looking around and I see the only person right now who looks like they're on the proper rule of thirds is who? Who do you think? Autumn. Sarah? I would no. say Sarah. Autumn's close. Autumn's yeah, close, but Autumn's, Autumn's a little too low. I'm just sure. Autumn's a little too low. But Sarah, Sarah's looking pretty good. Sarah looks like she's on the rule of thirds. Okay, now I want all of you, turn on your camera. If you haven't already turned it on, turn on your camera. I want you to position yourself on a rule of thirds. Ready, go. Position yourself on a rule of thirds. Make yourself look good. I'm, the time is rapidly coming when I'm going to start grading you based on the quality of your Zoom image. Wow, this, oh, this looks so much better, honestly. <laughs> So all of a sudden, my screen is very aesthetically pleasing. This is very nice. Okay, good. This looks good. So Nick, you're doing an extreme close-up for your rule of thirds. That's cool. You're going to want to aim. You're going to want to cut off the top of your head if that's what you're doing. So you want to aim that camera a little bit lower. Give yourself some chin room. There you go. Looking good. Looking good. All right. Cool. Cool. This looks great. This looks great. All right. Very good. Very, very good. All right. So we've got some nice rules of thirds there. Very good. Very good. You guys are a good class. Way to be. Good job, go team. Okay, which now brings us to the next part of our framing. Now that we understand the framing, okay, now we need to understand how to position our people in that framing. So we got the rule of thirds, okay, but now we need to understand which direction are they facing in? Which rule of thirds should I place them on? Should I place them on the left rule of thirds or should I place them on the right rule of thirds? Does it matter? What do you think? Does it matter? I think whichever way they're looking should have the most room. That is correct. Okay. Whichever way they're, it, it matters only based on which direction they are looking in. Okay. So I have this image here and this woman here, you can see she faces towards what we call the long side. And the long side is the space. Here's the short side. There is no space. Okay. We do this for a very specific reason. So take, take a look at my screen, for example. Okay, so if you look at if you look at my screen, am I? Here we go. Yes. Yes. No. There we go. All right. Am I good? Y'all see me now, nice and big. Okay, cool. All right. So if you look at my screen, for example, here I am on my rule of thirds. Okay. If I face this way, does that look right? It doesn't look right, does it? It just feels wrong. If I'm over here talking to people and all this kind of stuff, it just doesn't look right and it feels wrong. Why, why do you think that is? Maybe the audience feels out of the loop because the line of action is like pointing away from the camera. Yeah, I, I feel, don't, doesn't it feel like I'm kind of not even talking to you? Doesn't it kind of feel like I'm closing myself off to you, right? Like I'm over here and I think it's because it looks like I'm talking to a wall. Right. Because like here's this, it's like here's the edge of the frame. And it's like I'm over here talking. I feel like I'm trapped. I feel like I'm like up against the wall. Like visually, I have no space to move in. 
right? It feels like I'm talking to like something very restricted and I'm not connecting with the audience in any way. But if I turn this way, do you see how much better that feels all of a sudden? Like all of a sudden there's space here. I can move around a little bit, right? But there's also just room. There's just a natural room for the audience to feel like they, they're a part of, okay? So which rule of thirds doesn't matter as long as you're having your, your person talk towards the long side. They need to face towards the long side. You want this space here. So I can sit over here and I can give my lesson like this and this would be fine, right? There would be nothing wrong with this or I could sit over here and I can give my lesson this way. Okay, and when you're doing your interviews, you're gonna to wanna to do a little bit of both. If I'm interviewing uh, Sarah on one day, I'm gonna do Sarah because she's on the left side of her screen. And on the other day, I'm gonna interview Autumn because Autumn's on the right side of her screen, right? And that way, when I cut between them, it doesn't feel like a jump cut because I got one person over here and I got one person over here. So there's some nice variety there. Make sense? Cool? Cool, cool, cool. Okay, I feel like I explained that rather well. I'm very proud of myself. All right, continuing on. All right, so make sure that you frame that subject well, which brings us to the next part that you need to think about. You start to see how many things you have to think about. Like, we're not even done yet. We're not even halfway through yet. Like, there are so many things you got to think about, and we're not even talking about audio today. You see why I always have you guys work in groups? Like, it just keeps adding on and adding on and adding on. Like, there's so much that you have to do, right? All right, which brings us to shot composition. Okay, the idea is we wanna separate our subject from the background. Remember, film is a magic trick, right? Remember, it's a two-dimensional surface, but we wanna make it feel like a three-dimensional world, like a window to a three-dimensional world, even though it's not really true because it's just a flat video file. It's flat, it's just pixels, right? But we want it to feel three-dimensional. So how do we do that? Well, we wanna separate our subject from the background. All right, that makes it feel more three-dimensional. Well, how can we do that? How can we separate our subject from the background? Well, the easiest way to do that is just to literally separate them from the background. So if, I, if I'm looking at your screens, for example, let's look at each other's screens. So I'm looking at your screens, for example, who's got the best three-dimensional world going on right now? What do you guys think? Autumn's is, Autumn's is nice. Jeremy's is nice. Dana's is nice. Okay. Uh, Mia, Mia's would be nice if it was a little more blurred because she does have those nice leading lines. So that's pretty cool. Right. Um, I think Autumn probably has the best because Autumn's got the leading lines and there's some depth out there. Now, I wish it was a little more blurred. Right. But she's using like her computer webcam. So all these computer webcams, they don't blur the background very well. I've got the best depth of field going on here. Right. And that's because I'm using my fancy lens. I'm using my fancy DSLR 50 millimeter um, and it blurs the background and it separates me from the background. You see how like a little bit blurry that like it separates me. It feels three dimensional. That's what you want. OK, you want that three dimensional space. So the easiest way to do that is just to make sure that you have the person that you're interviewing just literally separate them from the wall. So like if I'm interviewing um, Autumn right now, I'd be like, Autumn, this looks great. I'm gonna have you take 10, 15 steps forward. Or Dana, this looks awesome. Like your, your wall is not bad, but I'm gonna have you step away from that wall. Okay, so, okay, so don't interview someone up against the wall. Okay, don't interview somebody standing right literally in front of a tree. You're not gonna get any cool depth of field that way. All right, separate them. Get a nice long distance between your background and your subject. That's the easiest way to make it look three-dimensional is to actually use that Z-axis, to actually use that depth, okay? Don't flatten out your image if you don't need to, okay? All right, so put some distance between your subject and the background. The other thing that you can do is use a really low F-stop. That's what I've done on my camera right now. I have a nice, really low F-stop. So the background gets blurry and that helps separate me from the background, okay? You've got some nice lenses in your kit, okay? You can lower your f-stops real low, okay? So you can get some nice low f-stops that'll really blur that background, and that'll create a nice shallow depth of field that'll really make your subjects pop, and that'll look really, really good. But when you do this, make sure you focus on the eyes. The, the story that I like to give here, my horror story that I like to give for this one, is that 
I was filming once as a very young filmmaker. I was doing a little set of interviews. Uh, I interviewed um, my friends. They had recently gotten married, and I said, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna interview you, and I'll record this little. I'll make a little documentary on your love story. And it'll be great. And then I can show it to like clients and get hired to like shoot weddings and stuff like that. And it totally works too. Um, but I made a big mistake. Okay, so here's my big mistake. Learn from my mistake. I was a young, ignorant filmmaker. Are you ready? So I went outside, and we were filming in this beautiful park. Um, it's full of flowers and everything was gorgeous. And I wanted that real shallow depth of field. So I took my out my 50 millimeter lens because I know that's the one that you want to use for this kind of stuff. And I made it real shallow. I put my F stop real low to like 1.4. Okay, which is really low. Okay. And then I was recording and I made sure that I was focused on the face and everything. And I thought for sure I had this amazing looking interview. And then I took it home and I put it into my computer and I looked at it in the editor. And you know what I noticed? I, my f-stop was so low that I had this eye in focus and this eye was out of focus. It looked so weird. The guy looked like Cyclops. It was the strangest, weirdest thing. And I was like, what do I do? I mean, the only thing I could do was I cut out his other eye and then put it on another layer and then sharpened the crud out of it and put like an unsharp mask on it and then lowered the whole thing's resolution to like 720. And believe it or not, that actually worked. Um, but I would not recommend it. Don't learn from my mistake. Do not go that route. Okay. Use a low F stop, but not so low that your margin of error is super razor thin. Okay. You want to leave enough room so that if that person moves a little bit, the camera can, can still keep them in focus. You, you need both eyes in focus, not just one. Okay. So learn, learn from my mistake. That is why I'm here teaching you today. All right, so focus on those eyes, because again, the eyes are the most important thing, as we talked about previously. All right, show things that add, but blur the rest. If it adds, okay, yeah, maybe keep it. If it doesn't add, blur the crud out of that, okay? So the example that I always give is, um, let's pretend, for example, um, I'm interviewing um, Carly. So I'm interviewing Carly, okay, because she's, she's in the middle of my screen. So I'm interviewing Carly, and Carly's not just Carly. Carly is a famous rock star musician. I don't know if you guys knew this. Um, so Carly is a famous rock star musician, and we're interviewing Carly about all the amazing things that she's done in her life. Um, so if I'm interviewing Carly, and I'm interviewing her in her music studio, okay, there might be things that add to the story that could be in the background. So maybe her guitars are on the wall or maybe the drum sets in the background or her gourd, her gold platinum record is like hanging on the wall. Like I might include that in the image. Maybe that's my wide shot when I'm doing this interview, okay? Now, if I'm interviewing Carly in the park and it's just a bunch of trees, okay, well, screw that. I don't need all that stuff in focus. I'm gonna blur the crud out of that so that it's not a distraction and that we just stay focused on Carly. Make sense? So you kind of have to pick and choose. Like right now, my shot's pretty blurred behind me, but I'm still getting the color and I'm still getting a few things. You can see there's a baseball behind me. You can see there's my cool Back to the Future shoes and Optimus Prime and stuff like that. You can still kind of tell what these things were. If I was doing an interview, I might do a wide shot of this with a little bit more of these things in focus because these things might actually add to who I am as a film teacher, for example. On this shot, for uh, however, I want to make sure that like the close up stays that popping from the background. So I'd want to make sure that it stays blurred enough that the that the subject pops. Does that make sense? Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Okay. So for example, I think I have an image here. Um, so for example, yeah, here we go. Here's a here's a woman outside of the park. Uh, which one would you rather have in your documentary? The second one. The second one. Yeah. Easy choice. The one on the right. The one on the right. She really pops in this one. I still get all the beautiful color. Right. I still get all the beautiful. I can still tell there's a leaves back there and all that kind of stuff. But now my eyes are focused on the subject, which is what's really most important. And this one, this one's too busy. Look at all this stuff that's going on. This is a distraction. This is much, much, much too busy. She looks, she looks like she's got branches and trees and leaves growing out of her head. That's, that's frustrating. Like, look, look, look at this branch. It goes like right through her. Like, I can't unsee that now that I've seen it. It literally looks like she's got like an arrow through her head. 
right? Because it's too much in focus. She looks like she looks like that brown wizard from The Hobbit, right? Like I don't like there's too many branches and leaves all over the place, right? This one's much, 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 much better. So make sure you're blurring your background. This this goes with your like photography work as well. If you're doing portraits, okay, the same rules apply. Okay, it's like separate separate your subject from the background and avoid busy background artifacts. Also, be mindful that you're not putting too much on the same rule of thirds. Okay, look at uh, look at my image here on my screen. Okay, I was very careful about where I placed all of these items on my shelf because I don't want these shoes right behind my head. This this looks weird. Do you see how this looks weird? Optimus Prime's like growing out of my head and there's like weird shoes behind my head that doesn't look good. This doesn't look good. Now I've got like an orange crown going on and my camera's gone out of focus. Okay, like that doesn't, that doesn't look good. I don't want that either. So I purposely, see how there's a little space here? I purposely made a little space in my background so that I can still have these fun little artifacts behind me but they're not invading in my territory. They're not invading on my rule of thirds. So be mindful of your shot composition. Be aware of the artifacts that are behind your subject. They can be a huge distraction if they are too in focus or if they're conflicting for the same rule of thirds as your subject. Make sense? Okay, let's move on because we got to keep moving on. I got a lot, lot more I still got to cover. All right, which brings us to lens choice. Now that we figured out our framing and our layout and our shot composition, let's think about the lens choice. Which lens do I use? I've got three of them, Mr. Taylor. Which one do I use? Well, it depends on what kind of a shot you want because they each do different things. So there's three types. You have three lenses in your kit because there's basically three types of lenses. There's, there's more if you want to get specific, but there's basically three types of lenses. There's the wide angle lens, okay? This is anything less than 50 millimeters, okay? Wide angle lenses have a nice large depth of field. That means they keep a lot of things in focus, typically. They show a wide space, okay? They also distort images. We'll talk more about that in a minute, okay? You have a standard lens. A standard lens is a 50 millimeter. You guys have that beautiful 50 millimeter, the one that I'm always telling you to use, the one that I say, use this one 85% of the time and your work will just look better, right? That's your standard lens, okay? We call it a standard lens because the 50 millimeter mimics what the eye sees. So the 50 looks like what we would expect our natural eyes to see, okay? So that's, so we got our standard lens. That's the 50. That's the one that does not zoom in or out. Okay. Then we've got the wide angle. That's the kit lens. The one I call the garbage lens sometimes, right? The one that I tell you almost never to use, right? Okay. That one's small and you can kind of zoom in and out with it. You might need that for a wide angle shot in your documentary. You might. Okay. And then we've got the big long one in your kit, the telephoto. All right, this one is over 50 millimeters. In fact, your telephotos go all the way up to 300 millimeters. That's cool, okay? These also have a very nice shallow depth of field. And these compress images. They do the opposite of what the wide angle lens does, okay? So what does that mean? Well, more compression is typically more flattering an image. So if you're doing photography and you're doing portraits, or if you're doing an interview, you want them to look good. Everybody wants to look good, okay? So you're gonna want more compression in that image because typically that leads to a more flattering image. I'm gonna show you what I mean. So take a look at this model here. So here's this model. This is the same camera in the same room with the same light. Everything is exactly the same. The only difference is the lens. So here's the woman at 200 millimeters. Here's the woman at 20 millimeters. This is the wide angle. This is a telephoto. Which one do you think she would rather be photographed at? Do you see what I mean? How this, the wide angle distorts the image. And the reason why it distorts the image is because the wide angle, in order to make it a wide angle lens, the, the lens has to be curved more and more and more in order to show more of the wide angle. That's, why, that's how we get fish eye lenses, right? So the wider the angle, the more curved the lens. And the more curved the lens, the 
the more distortion happens in the image. Okay, that means, for lack of a better term, and to put it very bluntly, all those unsightly features that you're embarrassed by, that you don't like, that you're trying to hide, they're going to be showed off even more in a wide angle lens. All right, the, the, the phrase I like to use is a wide angle lens makes big things look bigger and small things look smaller. A telephoto does the opposite. A telephoto makes big things look smaller and small things look bigger. It compresses the image. The wide angle just makes everything worse. So if you've got a big nose or a pointy head, guess what? It's going to be even bigger or even pointier if you shoot it with a wide angle lens. So you want to be mindful of that. Okay, here's, here's some more examples of this. So here again is the telephoto and here is the wide angle. You can see like, this looks like this looks like a different woman. Like it looks like a totally different woman, even though it's exactly the same woman. This actually happened to us once. I had a student who brought in this documentary. She was interviewing like one of the heads of Walden West. Anyone go to Walden West? I went to Walden West. Good times, good times. So she brought in she brought in this, this these dailies, and here's this woman, and we're we're watching it, and it, the lighting was bad, the camera angle was bad, everything about it was bad. It was not a good interview. And the girl was like, yeah, this does not look good. And we're like, yeah, this doesn't look great. And, but, but then she said, oh, but I have, another, I have another interview. And we're like, oh, okay, let's take a look at it. So we looked at this other interview and this woman looked way better, so much better. The lighting was better. It was a more flattering image. Everything about this was better. And we're like, oh yeah, she looks way better than the other girl. And the student got really confused and said, Mr. Taylor, it's the same woman. It's the same interview. She put up two cameras at the same time and hit record on both of them. But on one of them, she took the wide angle lens and shot it really close, so it was really distorted. And on the other one, she took the telephoto and then made it the wide shot, so it was really, really compressed. It was the exact same interview, the same responses, the same questions in real time. We actually thought it was a different woman because she looked so good in one shot and so not so good in the other shot. Okay, so don't make your people look not so good. Okay, like there's no reason not to. Okay, this applies to your photography as well. I expect all of you to have excellent looking social media profile pictures from here on out. No more bad selfies. Okay, like you make sure you're using nice tel long telephoto lenses. This is why this is why you don't look good in selfies a lot of the time, by the way, because selfie cameras are big wide angle lenses. You ever notice that? You ever notice that your selfie camera does not make you look good? You like the shot of yourself looking in the mirror instead, right? It's because it's a different camera. It's, it's a different lens. It's a wide angle lens versus not a wide angle lens. That's why. That's why selfie camera shots don't look good because they're wide angle lenses. Okay. All right. Last one. Here's, a, here's one more. This is a really extreme example. We've got 300 millimeters, but we've got 14. This is a fisheye lens. Look, look, I mean, that's a huge difference, obviously. Look, but look at all the lens distortion that happens here versus here, okay? Obviously, we would much rather be photographed or recorded on this nice telephoto shot, okay? So this is why you have those telephoto lenses. So use them to your advantage. Use them for portraits and use them for your shots for your interviews because it's going to make them look a lot better. All right, which brings us to lighting. Let's see, I got about 20 minutes left. Okay, I think I'm doing all right. We've got, we got 20 minutes left. All right, which brings us to lighting. So this is an image of my niece um, who um, I'm modeling here for this particular shot. Um, she's a lot older than this now. Um, this is a long time ago, but um, she's still very adorable. So there's my niece. Um, and so here's lighting. Now we have a lot of lights here at Freestyle. I'm not gonna have you check out any lights for your documentary because I'm not really teaching you lighting until next year when you're seniors. What I am teaching you this year is how to use natural lighting um, because I think that's an important foundation to have. You need to understand how to use natural lighting before we add on to it with other lights and things like that. So next year when we start learning about the different kinds of lights and how to use them, you're already gonna have a nice strong foundation um, that we can build upon. So we wanna use natural lighting for your documentaries this year. Um, and the important thing that you need to understand is that you want to light their face. Now, this seems really simple and basic, but I'm going to clarify that, okay? So the face that I'm talking about are the eyes, the nose, the mouth. This is this triangle right here. That when I say face, that's what I mean. I do not mean 
the forehead. I do not mean the cheeks. I do not mean the side of the head over here. I do not mean the ears or the hair or anything like that. When I say face, I mean literally just the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. That's where the action is. That's where the expression is. That's where the character is. That's where the acting is. Okay. That is the part that we need to light. Okay. The face. We need to light the eyes, the nose, the mouth. So we want, when we're doing our interviews, that is the space that we want to make sure gets light. Okay. All right. That light that hits the face is called the key light. It's typically the brightest light in the room. Typically, unless we're doing something dramatic for artistic purposes. Okay. But the key light is the one that hits the face, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. That is called the key light. So here on my niece, I've got a nice key light that is lighting her face. Okay. All right. Um, we also want light to help separate our subjects from the background. So if you look at my screen, for example, I have a nice key light that's shining on my face that you can see, but I also have behind me a light that is shining on the back of my head and on my shoulder to separate me from the background. This is what helps create that three-dimensional look. If I unplug this light right now, watch what happens. Do you see how I start to blend in with the background? Do you see how it's all of a sudden it's a flat image? All right? If I plug it back in, now all of a sudden I'm separated from the background. I start to pop more. It looks more three-dimensional. So that's something that you want to be mindful of. When you're doing your interviews, you want to have that nice, strong key light to light their face because that's really important. But you also want to have enough light to separate them from the background so you can get that three-dimensional look that we were talking about, okay? There's soft light versus hard light. What kind of light do you want? Well, it kind of depends on what kind of a story you're trying to convey. But typically, typically for your interviews, we usually prefer a soft light unless you're interviewing somebody really gritty, uh, you know, like a prisoner or, you know, somebody, you know, some grizzled war veteran or something like that. So if I look at your screens, for example, let's look at your screens. Turn on your cameras if you don't have your cameras on. Um, so let's take a look at your screens. So looking at your light right now, uh, you all got pretty soft light and that's because you're all close to a screen and the screen is shining its light on you. So you've got the light of the computer shining its light on you. So most of you all have pretty soft light. I would say the person with the hardest light right now is probably Mia. So I can see Mia like on the side of her nose, for example, I can see some darker shadows there. Um, that's a little bit more hard light, but even Mia is still pretty soft there. So I don't, I don't see any major, uh, oh, you know, Stella's got some harsher shadows a little bit. She's got some more clear shadows under one of her eyes there. Um, but for the most part, we've all got pretty, pretty soft light, which is a look that you probably want for most of your documentary interviews. Now, let's say you're going outside. Okay, well, let's say you're going outside and the sun is super bright and it's way up high. But Mr. Taylor, um, I know I need to light their face and I know everything needs to be at eye level and that includes the lights. How am I going to get the sun to be at eye level? I can't move the sun. I'm not that powerful. What do I do? Okay, well, that's, that's easy. What you can do is you can check out like a reflector or a diffuser, right? And you can bounce that light. You can even do this with a piece of paper or a, or a pizza box, right? We've talked about this before in the past. You can bounce that light from off of the sun onto your subject's face and that'll help. Or you can put them in the shade. You can shade them with a diffuser and that will break up that light and make it really nice and soft. Um, and so it creates a much nice, softer, more even light across their face. And then you can aim it into their face. Okay. That's what we want. We want that nice, soft light on their face. We don't care about their cheeks. We don't care about their ears or the fleshy mass on the side of the person's face. We care about the face face, the eyes, the nose, the mouth. If you do it right, you're going to get light in people's eyes. Just like my niece here. See how she's got light in her eyes, that sparkle. It makes them come alive. It makes them look alive and it looks really, really cool. If you do it right, if you light them properly where they're looking towards the light, you'll get light in people's eyes and it'll look really, really good. So if I look at your screens, turn your cameras, turn your cameras. If I look at your screens, let's see who's got light in their eyes. So Autumn's got a little bit of light in her eye, just a little bit. If she was sitting closer to the computer, she'd have more light because that's where the light's coming from. Yep, there it is. 
Uh, Nick's got a little bit of light in his eyes for the same reason. Yeah, there they are, because the light's shining off. But none of you have very good light on your face right now. Now, if Mia, Mia's got a great light to the side of her. She's got that window. So Mia, if you turn your face towards the window, watch her eyes light up. Do you see it? Do you see her eyes light up? Just like that. That's all she had to do. That's all she had to do. So if you aim towards that light, so I've got light in my eyes because I set up a light right here. You can see the light reflecting in my eyes. If you do it right, and I'm actually grading you on this, it's on your dailies um, star sheets that I have you do. Okay, did you get light in people's eyes? Okay, the trick to doing it is to keep that light at about eye level, maybe just a little bit above eye level and make sure it's shining on their face, their eyes, their nose, their mouth, okay? All right, now you don't have lights to check out, so you need to figure out how to use natural available light that's available when you're conducting these interviews. Okay, so be thinking about windows, doors, go outside, use you know lights that are available in the home, whatever you can do to get that light at eye level and shining on their face is what you, is what you wanna do. All right, eye lines. All right, uh, okay, we're almost there, we're almost there. Eye lines. Uh, make sure that your people don't look at the camera. You don't want your people looking at the camera. That looks weird. I think one of you already mentioned that, so that's cool. Don't look at the camera. Um, they should not be looking at the camera. Make sure the people that you interview know where to look, okay? Make sure you, they know where to look. It should not be at the camera, okay? And you wanna be consistent with that because if it's not consistent, it starts to look really, really weird. We very famously had a documentary once at Freestyle where um, they were, um, they were interviewing this guy who worked at a pet store. Um, and the interview looks like this. So I, I, work at the, I work at the pet store and it's pretty great. It's a nice animal shelter. And there's a lot of people that come in to find some pets. And you see the problem? I mean, it's, I mean, you should see the problem, right? Okay, first of all, these students had this guy in a swivel chair, okay? If you can avoid it, don't put your interview people in a swivel chair because they will swivel. They will swivel every single time, okay? Which is what we do, okay? So try, put them in a stool, put them in something else. Try to avoid, put, if you can lock the swivel chair, lock the swivel chair, don't let them swivel around. The other problem that these students had is they put the camera right here in the middle and they had one student over here and another student over here and they were both asking him questions. So the poor guy didn't know where to look. He kept looking at one student then he'd look at the other student and look at that student and look at that student. So he was all over the place, okay? All right, so make sure that you tell your person where to look and that they remain consistent so that when I'm doing my interview, I should look something like this. I should look probably right around here. And I'll be very consistent. So I'm conducting my interview and I'm always looking at the same spot. So my eye lines remain consistent. I'm not looking at the camera that gets uncomfortable really fast, but I'm looking just off to the person who's asking me questions and I can talk and answer and respond. That feels a lot more natural and normal the way it should, okay? Okay, 10 more minutes, I'm doing all right, okay. All right, so sit at eye level. Everything is at eye level, okay? The person sitting down, the camera is at eye level, the light source is at eye level, the person asking the questions needs to be at eye level, okay? So you wanna have everything where they need to be, all right? You want that person to look forward and just feel natural and comfortable, and that way um, everything's gonna look and feel great. Okay, their body should be facing the way that their face is facing. Okay, don't have their body facing one way and their, and their head facing the other. That's uncomfortable looking. Okay, don't do that. And make eye contact, okay? The person asking the questions should maintain that eye contact with the person that they're interviewing so that that person has a nice conversational look and feel to them. Okay? All right. So if you do it right, it should look something kind of like this. Okay, here is our subject. Here is the person interviewing the subject. You'll notice they're both sitting down. So they're both at eye level. Okay, then we've got the camera, which is also at eye level. Here's our camera operator. And, you'll, and they're just over here to the side of the interviewer. I would actually place this camera even closer to the interviewer. I would, I would actually move this camera right here. So if this is 12 o'clock and this is six o'clock, I would put this camera right here at seven o'clock. Um, but for the purposes of understanding how this works, this is a good, a good diagram. Uh, which rule of thirds, pop quiz, which rule of thirds is this subject on? Upper left. Upper left, why? 
because he he's looking to his left or to the right of the camera. That's correct. He's looking this way, which means this way must be the long side. And this way must be the short side, which means he must be, if this is the long side, he must be on the upper left. That is correct. Okay. So if you do it right, you're going to have a nice dual camera setup. Okay. So ideally, we do this with two cameras. We roll two cameras at once. That's the best way to do this because this gives you freedom when you're editing and post. Because now if you have someone who rambles on, we can take the first part of the, of the response that we like and the last part of the response that we like, and we can throw away all that stuff in the middle and we can edit them together and it feels nice. And because we stayed two away, remember we stayed two away in our shots. If we stayed two away, they put together real nice so we don't have to worry about jump cuts or having it feel weird or anything like that. And this gives us a lot of freedom to cut back and forth and cut out stuff we don't like while keeping all the stuff that we do. Okay, we can still keep the close ups for all those emotional important moments, just like we learned with DW Griffith, just like we learned during our narrative, those close ups will help endear our subject with the audience, the audience will empathize with them. So we're still going to get those close ups for those emotional moments. If you have a person who starts crying in your interview, you better get that close up when they start crying. Because that's a huge emotional moment, right? And just like we learned with narrative, those emotional moments, we want the close ups. We want the close ups, all right? So get those close ups for the emotional moments. If you have a dual camera setup, this is really easy. You got two cameras rolling at once. One just stays close up all the time, and one just stays wide shot all the time. And you don't have to worry about trying to get that close up when they start crying uncontrollably all of a sudden. You don't have to worry about it because you're already there, all right? That's, that's the nice thing about a dual camera setup. If you're going to do a dual camera setup, this is the tricky part. Are you ready? The close up camera should be on the long side to avoid going into extreme profile. So if you do it right, it's going to look something kind of like this. So here's our subject. Okay, here's our person who's conducting the interview. I'm sure that they're going to sit down when they start asking questions because they need to be at eye level. All right, here's our light, which is also at eye level. Here's our backlight, which is uh, uh, separating them from the background. So that's nice. And then we've got camera one and camera two. Now I can tell that this person is on the left rule of thirds right? Uh, because they're facing this way, which means this way must be the long side and this way must, must be the short side. And that means that this camera right here needs to be the close-up and this camera needs to be the wide shot. Any idea why? Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? I'll give you an example. So if I'm being interviewed, the person asking me questions is going to be right here. So I'm at 12 o'clock and then here's my person being interviewed and they're at six o'clock and we're looking right at each other. The camera, the close-up camera is going to be, let's see. Yeah, it's going to be like right here, right? So this is the close-up camera. So the close-up camera is going to be right over here, which would be seven o'clock. Okay, so there's my close-up camera. And the wide camera is going to be a little bit further, about 8 o'clock. Okay, why do we want the close-up camera closer to 6 o'clock, closer to the person asking the questions? Why? Maybe it, like, feels more vulnerable to have them turned closer to the camera yep, like definitely yeah definitely i mean look at look at this close up shot versus this close up shot okay i'm a little more closed off to you right now you can't see one of these eyes i told you that the eye is the most important thing and you're starting to lose this eye in this shot whereas this shot you can actually still see it okay all the emotion is going to happen here if i'm getting emotional on this shot or even this shot like if you're shooting way over here if I'm getting emotional on this shot here, it's not gonna, you're not going to feel as intimate with that person. So keep the close-up shot closer to being straight on to the camera. It's not going to be exactly straight on, but it's going to be closer to it. And then the wide shot can be a little bit further away because the wide shot, we don't necessarily need to see the eyes quite as much. We still want to see the eyes, but it's not, they're so far away. They're just going to be little dots on the screen, not like the close-up. Okay? So the way that you need to remember this, because I know this is kind of tricky, 
the way that you want to remember this is it's all the close up camera is always the one right next to the person asking questions. Okay. That's the way you remember it. Okay. The close up camera is close to the person asking questions. Okay. You can use that mnemonic device if it helps you. All right. No matter which rule of thirds they're on, if we flip this and move the cameras on the other side of this girl, the close up camera is still going to be the one closest to the person asking questions. Okay. That's always, always the case, no matter which way you're going, whether it's seven o'clock or four o'clock or five o'clock, doesn't matter. The close up camera is always going to be closest to the person asking the questions. Do you guys understand this? Because you're going to be graded on it. Do you get it? Stella has a look of confusion. She's good. All right. She's good, folks. She's good. Okay, cool. If you have questions, don't be afraid to ask me about it later if you need some help or set up a time with me during my office hours, because this is a lot. But if you understand all these rules, you're going to make it look good and your, and your work will come out looking professional and you will have success. Cool, cool, cool. This is a super cool video in which he kind of explains a lot of this stuff that we're talking about today. Hi, this is JP Morgan. Today on The Slanted Lands, we're going to show you how to shoot a simple two-camera profile interview piece with talent on location. You can use this piece for Kickstarter campaigns, corporate videos, documentary work, and individual company profiling. I'm out with my photography class showing them how shooting an interview works. Don't be intimidated by the amount of people you see on set. These documentary pieces I usually shoot in a crew of no bigger than three people. Many times, in fact most of the time, I've done them with just me and a sound person. It's even very possible to shoot these alone if needed. Before starting the project, I create an outline. Several points that I want to cover, where the company is located, what the main reason they are in business, how do they benefit the community. This outline should cover the main points I want to see in the interview and gives me guidance for the B-roll. Now I write a series of questions that through the interview process will illustrate the points in my outline. Finding a good location to shoot is critical. With Chip the Log Man, his personality was most important, but then the location was the next most important thing. If the location does not help the story, then I'll try to let it go out of focus and become undiscernible. In this case, I love the location and it helped tell the story. The logs in the wooden cabin, the workplace really gave us a sense of who our subject was and what he does. I had walked the grounds when I arrived and wanted to shoot with the logs in the background. It's important to find a good location or two before everyone starts to arrive and then the pressure's on, it becomes very difficult to make this decision. When it was time to shoot, it started snowing. My class was kind of scared, they didn't want to go out because it was stormy, but to me it was the perfect shot. I love how the falling snow looks in the frame, it was really beautiful. When I set up for an interview, I used two cameras. I set one on a wide medium shot and another one on a close up shot and have them run simultaneously. The wide shot camera is positioned looking straight at the subject. I place the close up camera on the right or left side of the medium shot camera depending on which direction I want the subject to look in the frame. If I want them to look to the right, I place the close up camera to the right, then I stand to the right of that. If I want them to look to the left, I place the close up camera to the left and then I stand to the left of that. Have the subject look right at you as you talk to them. Stand as close to the close up camera as you can. Their look will be slightly off camera but that's totally okay. You don't want their eyes jumping from camera to camera to you. It makes them look shifty or nervous. I used a two-stop ND to help throw the background out of focus just a little bit. Let's look at the lighting setup. Depending on when and where you shoot, you might not need lights at all. A bounce card on the person's face may be all you need. If I'm shooting outside, I just use reflector boards or a single softbox to brighten the face of the subject. In today's setup, we have a cloudy day and snow. We're going to use a new light that I'm testing for Photoflex called the North Star Light. I'm in love with this light because it's a single daylight balanced LED bulb in a strobe head that uses all the cool light modifiers. It's the equivalent of a 1K at 100 watts. I can use my beauty dish and soft boxes, reflectors and grids. All right, you're gonna hear a lot more about this light in the future. It's gonna come out in September. For sound, I usually use two sources. 
The first is a Sennhauser lav mic I put on the lapel recording into a zoom microphone. The microphone is clipped to his lapel and we're recording into a zoom recorder. It gives us a nice sound and cuts most of the car noise in the background as we're right by the highway. I'll usually use a shotgun mic as a second capture source. This way I have two sound sources in case one of them has a problem. There truly is an art to interviewing and one you'll need to practice. Let your subject know that when you ask a question, the audience will only hear their response. If I ask, how many years have you been in business? And he says, 12. Well, that's all I have is 12. He needs to say, I've been in business building log homes for 12 years. Help them to know that you need to repeat the question in their response. So tell it, why did you choose to go into logs? I mean, what, what started you into this business? Yeah, it's my second career. Uh, Let's start back, sorry. I got in this business because? I got in this business because? I try not to stop them and say, no, I want you to say this, or I need you to answer this way. Generally speaking, I try to keep coming back until I get the response that I think feels comfortable. When a question sparks emotion, I'm going to follow it right up with some other questions along the same line. Always look at the person when they're talking. Don't be looking at your notes or looking around or wondering about the camera. Make it really conversational. Laugh with them. Make the conversation feel comfortable and let it flow. B-roll is critical. B-roll is the footage that you shoot without sound that gives the piece its style. It's the shots of the logs, the machines, the people doing interesting things, the low angles, the crane shots. For me, using a crane or a slider takes your B-roll to a whole new production level. Make sure you have coverage of everything your subject talks about, or related things at least. B-roll really makes the story. You get the profile shots of the subject, shots with the family, shots of the subject at work. It's all the things that really make the piece interesting. Try to get as much coverage as possible. My rule of thumb is always shoot, don't turn the camera off. I also try to take as many beauty shots as possible and use my glide cam and slider to make that coverage look more professional. During the interview, listen to their responses. Make notes of the things that they talk about. Make sure you get B-roll to illustrate these things. If I say, I love playing with my dog, then you need B-roll of them playing with their dog. This makes the editing process go much smoother, makes the piece a lot richer. While I'm shooting my B-roll, I grab a camera, put it on a tripod, and start a time lapse, and then I just leave it. I'll run and do the things that I'm working on, I'll come back and reframe it and start it again. Just a little thought. I do love this process of interviewing. I love meeting new people and hearing their stories. I hope this will help you feel more confident as you do two camera interviews. Just keep those cameras rolling, keep on clicking. What I want you to do now, you do have an assignment, and this is what I want you to do. You've got two minutes left of class. And in the last two minutes of class, I'm gonna let you go, and you are gonna practice something before you go to English, okay? You have an assignment. You gotta email me something. It's gonna take you not very long. Are you ready? This is your assignment. Using your phone, I want you to take some photos to, to illustrate it. Boy, I spelled that wrong. I, I have an English credential to take some photos to illustrated good technical interview skills. So make sure you got your layout, your rule of thirds, your positioning, your use of natural light. Is it lighting your face? Is it lighting your face where it should be? Do you have light in the eyes? So this is what I want you to do, okay? So right now, before you go to English, okay? You're gonna take out your phone. You're gonna turn your phone because this is a film class and we're doing everything this way. Not this way, because we're not in junior high school. We're professionals. So we're going to turn our phones like professionals. Okay. What I want you to do is I want you to take three selfies. Okay. You're going to take three selfies of yourself pretending that you are a, a person be, a, in an interview setup. Okay. You're just going to take photos, not video, just photos. You're going to take three photos of yourself as you would an interview subject. Okay. You're going to place yourself on the rule of thirds. Okay, and mix up your rule of thirds. Do one on one side, do one on the other. Make sure you're facing the long side. Don't face that short side, okay? You're gonna be mindful of what's behind you. 
And your shot composition, is there something growing out of your head? Oh, that's not gonna look good. Better position myself somewhere else, okay? You're gonna make sure that you've got light, light in your face. Do you have light in your eyes? Okay, I want you to do this in three different locations. You're gonna send me three photos, okay? And you're gonna do it in three different locations, okay? So one in one room, one in another room, and one, do one outside if you can, okay? And then send it to me and I will look at them. And if they're perfect and they're wonderful, I probably will not respond. And if there's something that I think you can improve on, I will respond and say, hey, this is great, but you wanna try this, this, and this, and that will help your work look better for your interviews. This is the practice that we're gonna do, okay? Everyone understand what you need to do? This is gonna be your attendance for today. So make sure that you do it, okay? You, you can't skip it. I'll mark you absent, I will do it so fast, don't you test me, okay? All right, three photos. That's it. You've been an excellent class. Thank you for your attentiveness today. I will post this lesson up on the video world uh, later today, and I will share the slides with you as well. Uh, that's it. So long. Farewell. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.